Okay, Small Axe Community, welcome back to another episode of the show. I'm super excited because I got a cool dude on with me today, a former airline pilot, Satch Bernhardt. Satch is a real estate investor and former airline pilot for a U.S. carrier. His flying career ended when his airline shut down in the middle of the pandemic in 2020. This was a turning point in his mission with real estate. This made him realize how fragile airline carriers are, and he wants to help as many airline pilots as possible get financial security through real estate. He's now a co-GP on $77 million and 350 units, and has invested eight as a limited partner as well in $148 million worth of real estate or 726 doors. Satch, welcome to the show, man. Nico, thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk to you and uh, get your story and also kind of give the listeners some knowledge and experience into what it is about capital raising. But before we get there, let's, uh, let's kind of backtrack a little bit. So tell us a little bit more about how you got to where you are today. Yeah, absolutely. So never had I thought I would be uh, in business or an entrepreneur. I always wanted to be an airline pilot. And I, in fact, didn't even go to college. As soon as I finished high school, I went straight to flight school to learn how to fly. Um, became an airline pilot, then started flying for the airlines when I was 21. I, The more I started flying, I started discovering that um, many pilots were um, not having as much free time as they would like. And I... When I started flying, I didn't have a wife or kids, but I knew that eventually I was gonna have, uh, I was gonna want to have to form a family. And just from listening to conversations from other guys, you know, knowing that they weren't there for their kids, they were missing their kids' baseball practice, they were missing uh, time with their wife, or the family was going on vacation and they just couldn't go because they were out on a trip. Um, I started seeing these things, and I said, you know, I got, I got to start doing something to um, gain my time back, gain my freedom, and. That's when I got started in real estate. So I actually started in real estate in 2018 uh, just because of the same reason, right? I wanted to have another extra income, side income, so that I did not have to fly as much. The cool perk about being an airline pilot or just a pilot as a whole, regardless of who you fly for, is that you have a very flexible schedule as far as dropping trips, right? So if you did not care about making any money. You can potentially just drop all the trips on your schedule every single month and never have to work. Uh, obviously, you're not just not going to make any money, right? So uh, knowing that, I said, okay, if I can figure out a way to start making money on the side, I can only fly when I want to. And that way, I still, you know, I love flying. I love flying the airplane. Uh, but that way, I'm not gone too much. So that's what got me into entrepreneurship. And I started by... I started, I got into real estate by flipping houses. You know, I started wholesaling houses, flipping houses, and I started growing that company. Um, I did not know I was going to like entrepreneurship that much that I just went all in. And in 2020, obviously the pandemic happens and my airline shuts down. And dude, I mean, we were one of those airlines that we were fairly big. None of us thought that that was even a possibility in the horizon. And it happened. So luckily, I already had that income from my business that I wasn't too affected. You know, when the airline shut down, I was already not even flying that much. So to me, it was like, you know, just I lost a little bit of income. But I did realize how many pilots were struggling because they did not have that extra income. So I figured this is the opportunity here to, one, um, help as many pilots as I can, and two, uh, really have a mission with uh, my business to help more people, right? So the I started twisting. Now I started like coming up with my story and being able to come on podcasts and tell, I want to spread the word with as many pilots as I can to uh, have them come on board and, and knowing the benefits of having passive income in their life so that they can do a similar live a similar lifestyle that I was having when I was still flying. That's great, man. Um, kind of scary, right? But it, it sounded like, it sounds like you are already transitioning on your own just prior to the, I guess, to the airline closing down, but that kind of accelerated your, your, the process a little bit. So were you just doing wholesaling and fix and flips in 
between 2018 to through 2020? Yes. Um, that's all I was doing and that we still have the company. Uh, we actually grew the company and we have uh, 31 employees there now. Um, but the, I did not get into multifamily until about um, 2020, mid, mid 2021 is when I really got started into multifamily. I started investing in deals as a limited power, a partner, you know, I just wanted to see what it was like. And I was having all this income from, from the business that I wanted to put somewhere. Uh, so that, that was my start into the multifamily. Man, wait a minute, 30 employees, 31 employees. That is huge, man. What, what kind of business is this? Like, give us some context of what the business structure is like and what you guys do and how much volume you take in. Thank you. Yeah. And let me uh, add something to that. Uh, 50% of those are uh, overseas. Uh, so I don't know if, I don't know for many people listening, right? I don't know if that makes a difference on how you consider those employees, but um the business is we're strictly wholesaling. So we did a couple of flips uh, and we just did not want to do anything, anything to do with flips anymore, just because it's too much management. Every flip is a little bit different. Um, and we became very focused on strictly wholesaling. And that's all we do. Uh, we don't do any more. There's opportunity sometimes to like maybe take a property down or do a, a little bit of a different strategy or like some creative financing, but we just strictly don't do that. We are very focused on just wholesaling and that's what has allowed us to really grow. And, um, but that's, that's really it. We just wholesale single family homes. <laughs> where is the major, where are your markets? Um, so it's funny you asked because just today we expanded to two different, two more different States. Um, uh, but we, this whole time up until today, uh, we had only been in, in Florida. Wow, and, man. Yeah. And we do most of most of Florida. Uh, we obviously stay away from like the little, there's a very small towns uh, that you probably will never even hear of. Sometimes I don't even know these towns. They're like in the middle of the swamp somewhere, you know, so like we don't target there, but we do we target like the main metros in like all of those adjacent cities to those metros. This is amazing. And I'm not going to leave this conversation until I get a little bit more out of you on this. Uh, have you come into so I'm sure over the past few years, you've come into contact with some multifamily owners while you're, even though you're doing outreach for single family, right? Has that happened? And what happens then? Yeah. So in 2020, we came across a 46 unit, 44 unit. And at the time I did not have much knowledge in multifamily and we still put it on a contract um nothing came from it because what it was it was that it was um whatever the math comes out to be but they were all do, uh quadplex mm -hmm. so they were all different quadplex they were all not in the same lot there were different lots some of them were like in the same street some somewhere in the str next straight over so we thought we had an awesome 45 44 unit deal and it really wasn't it was just like uh What's the, what's the math? Uh, 10, 10 quadplexes, you know? So gotcha. when we were bringing it to people that were more experienced than us and, hey, we got this deal on our contract, what can we do? Everybody kept saying, well, that's not a commercial deal. That's just 10, 10 uh, quadplexes, you know? Gotcha. So um, we that ended up not working out. Uh, but to answer, to go back to the question, um, we don't really come across as many multifamily as you will think of. Uh, we strictly tailor our marketing down to very a very narrow uh, window of uh, property specs that we like. And that's it. Gotcha. I'm going to just ask a couple more questions on this topic because it is very interesting to me. Uh, first, where are the majority of your overseas uh, VAs? They're Nicaragua. Nicaragua. Cool, man. Yeah. Uh, I had a property over there that I just sold. I, it was my first uh, property. I bought a piece of land. I developed it, made it a small single family house and then sold it just this past December, 2021. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, cool. And, um, so what is their English like? Um, is the best by far in my opinion, comparing it to Many, many people that use VA foreign uh, overseas VAs are probably very familiar with like Filipino 
uh, VAs for this type of industry. And I don't personally like them. Um, we had many through the years in our company. And I just don't like two things. I don't like that they work through the night. And so like our business hours is their nighttime, right? So their living conditions are not the best. Um, and I don't feel like they're as efficient as they could be if they were actually working during the day. And the cultural differences, uh, I feel like there's a bigger gap in the cultural difference between us and somebody from uh, like Asia, as opposed to us and somebody from Nicaragua, right? And Latin America. I think there's a lot more similarities in like the TV shows that we watch and, and like the jokes uh, when they converse with people here in the US, uh, they get like jargon and things like that, you know? Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing. And um, another question would be, how long did it take you or what was your business like in the beginning? Uh, were you putting in all this money to hire cold callers and, and then you were getting some return or was like, how long did it take the machine to really start working for you? Mm. I guess about two and a half years. I made the first year was really just me making every single mistake possible uh, without knowing. And um, the second year was now that I knew what did not work was just me doing the stuff that did work, but I was still a single guy doing everything. And at the beginning of the third year, that's when uh, my partner and I got together and we really started uh, scaling the business and putting uh, people in place. So all this time I was doing deals. Uh, I was saving up money just to have enough money to be able to uh, afford the expenses of the business as we were growing. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, man. Um, and so, you, you know, you, you, you're doing these deals. Is there a typical, so I know that wholesaling is challenging and something that I have thought about, but never jumped into yet. But is there a typical return you like to see? Because I, I know you really got to know your stuff and you got to know that you're going to get a certain amount, right? To make it worthwhile. Um, I don't know how to, is there is there a way to quantify like a number or a percentage type of return that you like to get for each uh, deal you do? Yeah. Um, so the average, and I'll tell you uh, as far as like marketing spend versus uh revenue and the average is four to five times whatever you spend on marketing um and that's sort of where we're hovering right now we're probably right around of four x our marketing spent um the reality is that we spend a lot more than obviously there's a lot more cost other than marketing right so like right now we are spending about thirty five thousand dollars in just marketing every single month but between paying everybody in the company and all the payroll and stuff like that, uh, we end up around sixty-five to seventy thousand dollars, and our revenue a month is somewhere between one hundred twenty to one hundred fifty. Gotcha. And do you um how hands-on are you at this point, or are you just managing everybody? Um, it, it goes, it comes and goes. Uh, some some weeks is pretty uh hands off, and I'm not really that involved. And then um, uh, some days just a system or a process completely breaks down, and my partner and I have to jump in and like figure out a way to uh, make it better or improve it. Um, we were discussing about hiring uh some someone that that is like an integrator, someone that can come in and like be the person that is hands-on when things like that break um so we're in the process of doing like that i know it kind of goes against uh typical partnerships that one person is typical the the visionary and one person is like the integrator right but i mm -hmm. think somehow my partner and i both have the same um uh, qualities in that sense that both of us have a little bit of the visionary both of us have a little bit of the integrator uh, and i don't know if that's the best setup but we have been able to make it work. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's where we're looking for that other part of the business to come in and take that. That's awesome, man. I look, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Right. As long as it's working. Yeah. Okay. Now does your partner also invest in multifamily at this point? No. Um, so we both started in the single family space. And once I started going into multifamily, he, 
um, once we actually once we started getting, getting our time back and our freedom to be able to do something else, um, I knew I wanted to go for multifamily, and he is just kind of still to the date. I think he's still kind of like trying to figure out what he wants to do. I know he's interested in a lot of uh, cryptocurrencies and things like that. So cool. I'm still not sure what he wants to do. Cool, Satch. I'm loving this conversation, man. I'm really enthusiastic here. Now, uh, okay. So, what do you like about multifamily? Um, I'll, so I'll tell you two things from the passive investor side. I like how hands off it is. I, so I grew up with my family in Mexico. We had real estate growing up and I had always seen how, um, how much work it requires to upkeep tenants and all their demands. Um, so I just never looked, I don't own any single family homes. I just don't care to own them. Um, even though we do deal with them because that's our business, but I just don't want to hold any of them as a rental. And, um, but what I do like about multifamily is the, the economies of scale, uh, the ability to close. So we can buy a uh, hundred unit, we can buy a 50 unit and we don't have to do 50 different closings, right? It's just the one closing and we bought all those units at the same time. Um, they trade for multiples of their income as opposed to comps. Uh, that's probably the two biggest things that attract me to multifamily. The ability to, uh, and actually this is probably another big one, which is the ability to leverage other people's uh, expertise. Mm -hmm. um, in the single family world, I feel like a lot of people um, just become very self-reliant uh, and you don't really leverage many other other people just because either there's there's just not enough margin on every single deal to for you to bring that many people on the team right and there is uh really not a need for you to like flip uh if you're maintaining a house right you can do it yourself so it just becomes harder to scale once you get to a certain number and yeah. um so yeah those are my the things that drove me to multifamily and from the uh operating side i like that i could leverage i wanted to focus on capital raising um i did not want to come in there to multifamily and be uh, operating deals because once i did not have the expertise to do that i recognized right away that there were guys in the space that were doing that have been doing it for a long time that they had very good uh track records that if I try to compete with them, there's just no way, right? I'm going to start today with year zero, with a zero track record competing against guys that had 10 plus years of doing it and had multiple exits. So I thought instead of trying to compete against those guys, why don't I just team up with them and, and figure out a way to do deals together, you know? Um, so that's what I love about the active side of multifamily. That's awesome, man. And you're absolutely right. There are so many different positions that we can and roles that we can fill on the active side. One of them as a newer investor could be like what I do. I try to find a deal and lock it up and then I'll grab the right people to kind of uh, operate it or bringing in capital to the deal. You, you need the deal and you need capital, right? So we can all pull together these different resources and I'm scrambling for capital. You know what I mean? So I need people to do it. So those shoes to fill are, ne are necessary, right? So phenomenal. And you get you get a share of equity in the deal on the GP team. And you get experience working alongside people that have done this before, exactly like you're talking about. And it's just, I think it all around is phenomenal to be able to work on a team of professionals. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Such, uh, was your first deal a as a limited partner or did you go right in as a general partner? No, it was as a limited partner. I actually invested in four deals as a limited partner because I just wanted to see uh, what it was like to invest in a multifamily deal before I went on and, and started raising capital from other investors to invest in deals. Um, once I started seeing the type of communication, the type of returns, and I learned a lot of things once I was already invested that I did not know, uh, that's when I felt comfortable enough to be able to explain to someone, this is what you can expect. This is what it looks like, et cetera, et cetera. Awesome. Thank you. And is now your typical outreach to your pilot friends or all your friends and family, or who, who do you speak with, speak to these deals about? 
Um, so it's a mixture. Um, the people in my database, the investors in my database, even though I cater to pilots as much as possible, uh, you will be surprised how many people that are not pilots at all reach out to me. Um, and so I'll say my database is about 40% pilots, 60% just people that were referred by someone else within my network that, that know that I'm doing multifamily deals. Um, so yeah, I just keep, I keep catering for pilots and, and just letting people come from wherever they come. I love it, man. How do you begin presenting a deal to your investors? Um, you mean as far as like, what's the first outreach? Do you just send them an email? Hey, I got a deal. Or do you get them on the phone or do you send them texts? Yeah. The first outreach is, um, an email and then, uh, I gauge, I start gauging interest from there. And then I will send a text after the email and then we'll throw a webinar after that. And that's pretty much it. Do you give them like, do people reply to that first email or do, or do you give them a portal to look at right away or some documents to look at? Um, I put everything on that email. So I put them, I give the access to the portal right there. If they want to self commit and get, get going. Some people just self commit without even talking to me. Um, and, uh, I put my phone number. A lot of people just call me right away and they want to know a little bit more about the deal. Um, so it's a little bit of a mixture. All right, cool. So let's talk about, uh, I guess, the shortest conversation, like the quickest person to convert and then maybe the hardest person to convert. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the I'll tell you that the shortest person to convert has already invested in uh, with me in three deals yep and the last two he just did not even know what the numbers were he just said just let me know whenever the next one is and i'll invest um so which is pretty awesome you know i love having that confidence i still even though he tells me that i will still send him an email just highlighting like this is the returns this is the deal where the deal is located this is why i like it and this is why I think the downside is protected. It, it is just it just helps me sleep at night knowing that you know that I know you trust me, but this is still you know what I'm doing to make sure that this deal is solid. Um, the hardest one. Hmm, let me think about this one. The hardest one is probably uh, another investor who had been in my database for maybe about a year. Just kept seeing deals come through. Uh, told me a couple times that. Uh, she will invest and never did. Um, so I was counting on that money sometimes, you know, obviously we kind of you rise above what you think you can get, right? So um, it took about four deals for that person to actually come through. And on the last one, it was like, hey, here it is. I'm ready to go. Awesome, man. Thank you for sharing uh, such. And I want to elaborate a little bit more on that just to say that, um, the hard one, like I never try to close anyone, right? Mm -hmm. So I never try to like push anyone over the edge. Um, I try to be very open. Like this is a deal. If you want to invest, invest. If not, this might not be not for you. This might not be for you or you, this might not be the right time, right? Mm -hmm. Or just get comfortable looking at the deals that I'm putting out and ask me questions whenever the right time is. Just let me know. Um, so that's sort of my the expectation that I set with everybody that, I speak with before they join my list. And so maybe the hard part is that, you know, the hard part is that they just don't invest right away, right? They kind of want to see a trend. They want to see the deals you're putting out. They want to see that you're sticking around, that you just didn't do just one deal and then you disappear, right? Mm -hmm. Very important, man. And would you mind sharing the biggest raise that you've done? Yeah, the biggest raise um, was this, the 350 unit. Um, and I actually did not, I came up shorter than I thought I was going to be. Um, so I ended up with 150 for that deal. And what's interesting was that I've raised over a million dollars so far in three different deals, but every single deal has been, uh, like 150, 150, 250, uh, just like that. 
that, that's phenomenal, man. Now, let, ha, has the have investors recently been less enthusiastic about investing? Yes, um, I do find uh, that a lot of investors have more concern about what's going on on the market, and people that were very, I I don't. I don't know if this is the right word, like aggressive on them wanting to invest in real estate. Um, now they're pulling back people that were like texting me every day, dude, when is the next deal? When is the next deal? Uh, now they don't text me anymore. And I think it's just because they see what's going on in the single family space, single family home space. And now they correlate that to multifamily, right? And they think that it's the same thing. Um, so I try to put content out there to my investors to reassure them that what's happening uh, on the market is still, uh, yeah, it's not looking so good. But even though if we put a deal there, if we put a deal out is because we have done all our due diligence and we turned down a lot of deals, like the amount of work that goes on before even a deal gets put together is so intense that, um, I just want to leave the bring up the level of assurance to them that it's not just a deal that we found and we said, hey, listen, this might work, you know, here it is. Um, so, but yeah, definitely a lot of, I feel a lot of investors are pulling back. Yeah. I've experienced the same recently. We're now uh, in mid October, mid to late October. And it's, it's just, the times are getting a little scary, right? People are worried about the inflation. People are worried about the raising interest rates. People are worried about the recession, right? And these things are all valid concerns, but just as you're saying, uh, from a GP perspective, we do our due diligence. And if a deal makes sense, we're, we're accounting for all these challenges, right? We're not just underwriting with a, a 3%, um, you know, loan, you know, rate, right? We're an and ADLTV anymore. We're not doing that anymore. We're underwriting properly. And if God forbid, you know, we go in there and let's say we do inspections and then there's $500,000 in CapEx or the interest rate is now 8%, right? We don't just do the deal anyway and say, oops, you know, and, and our investors are going to pay. We don't. We will walk from a deal before letting that happen because we need to get those returns for our investors. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Cool, man. All right, Satch, let's transition to our final question. And my man, this is going to be a doozy. Are you ready for it? Hit me. Okay, let's imagine it was 100 years from now, you have great, great grandchildren, and they want to write a book about you to honor you and your life. What would you want them to title this book? How to get things done. Um, I've, I, I think that I'm very, um, I take a lot of action fast in um, probably a little too fast sometimes. And, uh, <laughs> and, but I true, I truly think that, um, that's like the X factor that allows me, um, I combine action and speed. Um, and that really allows me to make big strides in things, um, uh, in whatever I'm trying to accomplish. Um, and I'll be honest, I make mistakes, right? So, but I, even though I make mistakes, I feel like because I make that mistake a lot faster, I'm able to correct action and realize, okay, that was not the way to do it. Take action, take corrective action and go a different direction. Um, so if there is anything that I can, uh, like someone can hopefully learn from me hundred years from now is to not overthink uh, everything and just take action um obviously there is time and place for everything flying an airplane i wouldn't be as i wouldn't take the same approach right mm -hmm. uh, everything needs to be um done the right way when you're doing something like that and you're dealing with uh people's lives in the back but when you're dealing with uh a business decision or something like that that won't have that much of an impact you know shit worst case scenario lose a couple thousand dollars but already you know, figure out that that was not the way. Um, it's worth it to me. Beautiful, man. I love that. A lot of people talk about, you know, you know, building the parachute on the way down, you got to get it done, right? You're going to make mistakes and it's fine, but you got to get it done. Jump, 
then build a parachute. There's also the other thing that my mentor says, you know, done is better than perfect, which I agree with. Get things done, get them out, and then reassess and reevaluate, you know, where you stand. So, Satch, it has been phenomenal talking to you. I'm excited to get to know you and to learn your story. I'm really excited to hear about your journey, and I was really enthusiastic listening to what you taught us today. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Appreciate you having me on the podcast. Yeah, it was man. awesome. Oh, you're the man. Let's get some people, some form of contacting you before you go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for many, pal- any, if you have any pilots in your audience or anybody that relates to that top, type of industry or lifestyle, um, if you have been uh, wanting to figure out a way how to scale back on how much work you put into your uh, day job, uh, go grab my ebook. Is on Bernhardt Capital, like my last name, bernhardtcapital.net forward slash ebook. It's completely free. I have a breakdown there of um, how to tell which syndication is good, how to vet the sponsors, a lot of tips that you need to know uh, before you invest in a syndication. Dude, that is awesome, man. Such, I'm really excited to have met you. Thank you. Thank you, Nico.